Welcome to Dead Man Talking. Tonight's story is another fantastic spine chiller by the wonderful mind of Head of Spectre. As ever, please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear? And so, with that aside, let's get into tonight's story, entitled Conventional Werewolves. Let's get straight into that. I've seen some shit in my line of work, but I don't think I've ever seen anything as brutal as the murder of James Kellum. When they call me in, nine times out of ten it's just an animal attack. Vicious, but never malicious. When animals kill, they do it because they're hungry or they're scared. And I know how to recognise the signs. I know better than most, actually. And with Kellum, though, there was a genuine malice. This wasn't an animal attack. No, this was a werewolf. There wasn't a doubt in my mind about that. This man had been hunted down. Ten kilometres outside of Hamilton, he'd been knocked off his motorcycle and dragged into the woods. He'd probably try to fight, but he wouldn't have stood a chance. I've seen an adolescent werewolf shred a bodybuilder into confetti, and the bodybuilder couldn't do a goddamn thing about it. Kellum's right arm had been torn out of a socket. His face had been slashed, so as to tear open his left cheek, exposing his teeth. The werewolf had bitten into his throat, ripping through vital arteries and severing his windpipe. His neck, hmm, was broken. I imagined that was from the werewolf shaking its head after it bit down. His shattered skull was only still attached by a few flaps of skin. All of this damage had probably been done within the first ten seconds of being dragged into the woods. Werewolves are quick and efficient killers. If it had just been this, I might have let it be. But there was so much more. Kellum had been dragged deeper into the woods, away from prying eyes. I'm sure he was still alive for the first few seconds of his trip. It takes a while for the brain to completely shut down. If he'd lived any longer than that, he would have died when the werewolf tore open his ribcage to get at his vital organs. And they weren't trying to eat, although his heart was mostly consumed. The gesture seemed to just make absolutely sure that James was dead. He'd been gutted and torn in half. His skull had been crushed in the powerful jaws of his killer. His torso had been torn in half, and the half that contained his head was impaled on a tree branch, like a crude display. It was all deliberate, and there was an intelligence and hatred behind every memory of violence left behind on that carcass. I don't know what Kellum did, but the evidence suggested that the werewolf was not very happy with him, and it was my job to find out why. There aren't a lot of detectives like me. In fact, as far as I know, I'm the only one in Ontario, and there's less than 15 of us in the country. People don't talk about werewolves very often, and it's better to keep that sort of thing quiet. If people knew that werewolves were out there, they might not take too kindly to it. And what do you do when someone takes everything you know and turns it on its head? Accept it? Reject it? or true to human nature, trying to kill it? I think the answer is obvious. The people in the loop keep their knowledge of werewolves quiet because, if they didn't, a lot of good people would be in danger. Everyone always assumes that werewolves are monsters, and some are. But not all of them. No, most werewolves are more or less normal people. Chances are, you've met a few. There were no distinguishing traits. They don't act like dogs or stand out in any noticeable way. Take me, for example. My name is Howard Kalenchuk, and I admit it. I'm a werewolf. Some say that lycanthropy is a curse. I don't agree with that. I know I'm not a monster. I'm just a man with a condition. And when the full moon comes, I change. And when I change, I hang out in my basement. I lay on the couch and watch TV until I change back. Exciting, 
right? But it's really no different than what most dogs do at home. Sometimes I'll indulge my baser instincts. There's something about a wild run through the woods that ignites my primal fire in my soul. But I am not a monster. I do enjoy hunting, but I confine that to deer and other wild game. Nothing that upsets the natural order. Teeth and claws are a cleaner way to kill than a gun, that's for sure. I can safely say I've never harmed a human that didn't already have it coming. As a cop, I make a point to stay on the right side of the law. Werewolves who don't either get a silver bullet or get put to sleep. I view my lycanthropy as a part of me. It's nothing to be worried about. It's just a thing that I am, and I do a bit of the use it to my advantage where I can. There's very few werewolf cops, and those of us who exist are specially equipped to assist the rest of the force with any suspicious animal attacks. I can smell the wolf on the victims, I can identify the bite marks, and I can help figure out who was responsible. Werewolves are not exempt from the justice system, they're just harder to catch. When I got a call, I wasn't expecting the death of James Kellum to be anything more than a simple animal attack. Tragedies happen all the time. Looking at the crime scene though, it was obvious that it had been a werewolf. This was almost textbook. The brutality, the familiar smell of another wolf, all of it was a dead giveaway. Well, what do you think? Asked the officer in charge of the crime scene. Maybe it was a bear. He was a younger man, with blonde hair and steely eyes. His name was Delaney. I didn't catch his first. He didn't know who I was. I just needed to flash my badge and say I was with the Animal Attacks Division of the OPP. And that was more than enough. A bear? This close to Hamilton? I asked and shook my head. No, I think I've seen all that I need to. I turned to leave and Delaney followed me. Hey, are you sure? Don't you need an autopsy or something? He asked. I just shook my head. Ah, uh, there's no need for that. The cause of death is fairly obvious. I might stop by the coroner's later if I need another look. Delaney looked confused for a moment before nodding. Right, okay then. I walked back to my car and left the crime scene behind. I snapped a few pictures with my phone, mostly of the layout of the crime scene and the bite marks. But the local police would gather most of the evidence themselves and I could refer back to that later. And since this was a werewolf attack, it only made sense to start looking for a werewolf. And I knew just who to talk to. The Bulldog Pub was the werewolf hotspot in Hamilton. I always thought it was weird that they called it the Bulldog. I would have thought that you'd at least pick some sort of wolf pun. But for some reason, Adrian Damaski decided otherwise. I suppose it was inconspicuous at least. Adrian had no official authority, but every community of wolves has an alpha, and werewolves were no exception. Perhaps in days gone by, the alpha was determined by strength. These days, though, it's all about the community. Adrian owned the bulldog. He did the most for the Hamilton werewolves, and for that reason, he was the alpha. The bulldog didn't look any different from your average downtown bar. It was never too busy, but never really dead either. The second I walked in, I caught a young couple in the booth staring at me. I could smell the wolf on both of them, and gave them a reassuring nod. They nodded back, and their attention returned to their spinach dip and conversation. I strode up to the bar, where I spotted a familiar youth. He wore a Pokemon t-shirt and looked at me with a noted wariness. His hair was dyed electric blue, and his eyes had a shifty look to them. He looked like a mess. Morning, Alex, I said softly. I ain't done nothing, officer, he said. His tone was disagreeable. They told me to leave, but I had business to attend to. Then maybe you should fix that and move your ass, I replied. I'm looking for Adrian. Is he here? Alex grimaced for a moment, but finally managed to nod. Out back, he said. In his office. You got an appointment? I got a badge, I said, moved past him and headed for the back. Why, he's busy, Alex called after me, 
but I didn't pay him much mind. I'd been to Adrian's office before, and it didn't take long for me to find it. The door was unlocked, and so I let myself in and found the man at his computer. He looked up at me, eyes somewhat surprised, but if he had anything to hide, he didn't show it. Howard, he said warmly. Well, well, this is a surprise. Business or pleasure? Business, I'm afraid, I said. And we got a body. Adrian's smile faded. What? In Hamilton? Yep. The motorists saw a bike on a road this morning. They stopped to investigate and found the remains of one James Callum. I took out my phone and brought up a picture of the deceased prior to his morning, of course. Adrian studied it for a few moments, eyes narrowed. Recognize him? I asked. Vaguely, Adrian replied. I think he came in a few nights ago. I was working the bar. I could smell the blow on him. Figured he was looking to sell. What happened? I asked. Adrian looked up at me and I could see him hesitating. There was, let's say we got into a disagreement. I run a clean establishment, Howard, and I'm not letting some fucking lowlife sell blow to my wolves. How bad of a disagreement? Uh, maybe some shouting. I may have told him to get the fuck out before I ripped him in half. My eyebrow raised at that, and Adrian didn't miss it. I suppose I don't have to ask how he died, he said. I didn't answer that. So, aside from you, did he piss off anyone else? I asked. Adrian thought it over for a bit. I didn't see anyone else giving him shit. I recall him talking to Elena before I stepped in. She left before the screaming started, though. Elena? Eleanor Knight. Adrian nodded before cracking a small smile. I tried to ignore it. It wasn't exactly a secret that Elena and I had a history together. You want her address? When there was something mocking in his tone. I suppose I'll need it, I said. You want me to just send Alex over instead? I'll be fine. Adrian whistled and reached for the sticky note on his desk. He scrolled down the address and handed it over to me. Uh, between you and me, I doubt she's still mad at you, Howard. Hmm, well, she's not the one who should be mad, I replied, before taking the note and pocketing it. Thanks for the help, Adrian. Don't mention it. Keep me in the loop when you find the guy who did it, even if he's a killer. I want to be there when they put him down. Poor bastard deserves a friendly face. Hmm, no malice in his tone. I suppose I understood that. James had been a drug dealer. He was hardly an upstanding citizen. Murder is punished by death among werewolves. I've seen it happen plenty of times. You could argue the sentence, if you could prove it was self-defense or you had no choice. They'd usually let it slide. But this had not been self-defense. This was a clear-cut murder. Even if the victim had been a real piece of shit, I'd still be sending a wolf to their death. And the gravity of that was not lost on me. I hesitated before knocking on Eleanor's door. How many years had it been since we'd seen each other? Five? Longer? Last I heard, she turned her life around and got him clean. I was proud of her for that much, although I'd never say as much to her. And what would she look like? And would she be mad at me for leaving her? I'd be lying if I said she never once crossed my mind in the past few years. Before she started using, she had meant the world to me. Ultimately, that was why I left. I couldn't watch someone I loved dope themselves to death. I knocked on the door and waited quietly for her to come. The door opened and I saw Eleanor's calm blue eyes peering back at me. Howard? Her voice was light and airy, like a gentle summer breeze. Hey, I managed to say. Long time, huh? Yeah. It's... D did you want to come in? I nodded, unable to find the words. Eleanor looked good. Her skin was radiant and healthy. Her golden blonde hair spilled perfectly over her shoulders. She was just as beautiful as I had remembered. More so, perhaps. I stepped inside, still admiring her, and I caught a shy blush on her cheeks. So, uh, what brings you back to Hamilton? Oh, d did you want a drink or something? I'm sorry. No, it's fine, I said, 
I won't be staying long. I'm, I'm here on business. God, what an awkward attempt at conversation. I could barely make eye contact with her. You look good, Eleanor, I said. Thanks, she replied. I thought I caught a slight whiff of cocaine from her, but I didn't say a word. I wanted to ask about this man, I said. James Kellum? I reached into my pocket and showed her the picture. Eleanor stared at it and seemed to take a moment to collect her thoughts. I've seen him, she said, at the Bulldog a few nights ago. And did you buy anything off of him? It sounded accusatory and I immediately wished I could have taken it back. No, no, I, I don't do that anymore, she said and paused. Although he did offer, and he did some himself, I said no, though. This was at the Bulldog? I asked. No, um, it was here, she admitted sheepishly. I was... James was a smooth talker. I only ever saw him on the one night. He left in the morning. I told him I didn't use any more. He asked me if it was okay if he still had a top-up, and I said, well, I said yes. I watched her carefully. I couldn't tell if she was lying or just embarrassed to admit to her ex that she had another man over. He stayed the night? I asked, and she nodded hastily. Yeah, he did. I haven't seen him since then. All right. I tried not to dwell on those thoughts of her and James together. Going back to the night that you two spent together, uh, did he get into any other disputes? I heard he got into quite a row with Adrian. He did, but I didn't see it. Eleanor replied. Before that, he was mostly talking to me. I got the impression that he was a little bit oblivious, actually. I don't think he knew much about the Bulldog or its usual patrons. He was just a cute hustler, looking to sell. And that's it? That's it? Eleanor said. Adrian was the only one who really got on his case. I suppose he smelled the blow, and from what I heard, Adrian really went off on him. She thought about it for a moment before adding. I think Alex was following us on the way home. He was watching James pretty closely before Adrian got involved. He's always had an attitude on him, but this time, this time it seemed a lot more intense. I nodded. It wasn't damning evidence, but it did make me consider returning to the bulldog or the morgue. I got the call while I was on my way to the morgue to examine the body a little closer. Maybe I'd be able to pick up a scent or something. I was a little bit surprised to find Delaney on the other end of the line. Hope I'm not disturbing you, he said. Thought you might be interested in something we found, though. I might be. What is it? Couple of things. We found some traffic cam footage of James's motorcycle that you should see. And the other thing? I just come down to the station, Delaney said. It'll be easier just to show you the footage. I turned my car towards the station and headed over. He had my attention. The morgue could wait. Delaney was waiting for me when I arrived. We just did a quick search for the plates on that bike, he explained as we walked through the station. Figured it might tell us something. Looks to me like it did. He led me to his desk where his computer waited for us. I recognized an intersection near the highway on the screen. Delaney sat down behind his desk and started a video, awfully considerate of him to have queued it up for me. So, we see James pass by here, he said as the video played. And sure enough, I spotted his motorcycle with him on top of it, and another person, a woman by the looks of it, clinging to his back. When was this taken? I asked as Delaney paused the video. Six hours before the body was discovered, about three hours prior to the time of death. Keep watching, though. It gets better. He started the video up again, and I watched as the lights in the intersection turned yellow. A truck started to enter it, only to be cut off by a second motorcycle, speeding up to catch up with James. Oh, they're in a hurry, I murmured, and watched as the bike sped off towards the highway. And what does that look like to you? Delaney asked like they were trying to catch the light. Did you get a look at the bike? 
Delaney rewound the video and slowed it down as the second bike drove past. Same make as James. Might just be a coincidence, but but I'm thinking it might not hurt to check it out. You might not be wrong, I said. Delaney paused the video as the rider was driving past. I could see dark hair flowing out behind the driver and spotted a skull patch on their sleeve. That, that could be our killer, Delaney said. What about the other girl on James's bike? I asked. There was no sign of another body at the crime scene. Well, yeah, that's what I was thinking, Delaney said. Possible witness, perhaps. Hmm, perhaps. Can you make out the plates on the bike? I asked. Well, let's run them, see what we get. Delaney leaned in closer to the screen before reading off the plate. I wrote it down on my phone and thought about giving Adrian a call. If the second biker was our killer, then she'd have to be a werewolf. And if she was a werewolf in this town, Adrian would know her. He had to. Skull patch, huh? He said over the phone. I couldn't read his face, but I had a feeling his brow was furrowed. It doesn't ring a bell. Not a lot of biker sorts in Hamilton. And what about the surrounding area? London. Mrs. Sager. Gulf. And Vaughan. I don't know werewolves in Vaughan, Adrian said. Gulf, yes. I can give the Alpha over that way a ring. Can't promise you much, though. You think an out-of-towner did this? I'm exploring all possibilities. I replied before hanging up. I turned to go back into the police station when my cell phone rang again. I answered it unthinkingly and paused when the dispatch on the other end of the line told me that there was another body. The apartment complex was on the more run-down side of town and was just about the last place I'd expected a werewolf murder to occur. And this time, the victim was Jim Braley. I dealt with this asshole before, Delaney said as we walked into the apartment together. Can't say I'm sad to see him go. What did he do? I asked. Kitty Fiddler. Thinks he's some hotshot internet personality because he has YouTube. He plays video games and supposedly asks underage girls to send him pictures. Kind of a shut-in, honestly. Getting upstairs, we found the corpse in the apartment hall. Jim lay against the wall in the sweatpants and a female body inspector outfit. His eyes were half-lidded and his throat had been torn out. But there was no other damage to his body, unlike James. He had him been torn to pieces. An apartment door just across from him had been knocked off its hinges and I could see other officers inside. My gut told me that this wasn't a related crime, but all the same, I crouched down to examine the body. Someone must have really hated him, Delaney said, and his eyes narrowed when he saw the fatal gash in his throat. Doesn't look like a knife wound, though. Looks like... Hmm, a claw, I said. You hear anything about witnesses? A little. The way the officers on the scene told it, the old couple a few doors down heard a lot of banging, followed by screaming. They came out here to find this mess. Delaney nodded towards the door. That is apartment... I asked. Nope, it belongs to some girl named Clara Glick. She's not home right now. I walked into the apartment, looking around quietly. The inside was a mess, but more importantly, I could smell a wolf. One of them had been here, and recently. There had clearly been a struggle of some sort, and I paused to look at the glass door leading to the apartment's balcony, and drew closer to it. And was this open when we found it? Nothing's been touched since we found it, Delaney said as I stepped out onto the balcony. And it was just a two-story drop to the ground below, not too bad of a fall. And was Jim in the apartment? I asked. Could be he and Clara had a dispute of some sort. He comes in, she throws him out and kills him, and then runs. And knocks the door off its hinges? Delaney asked. I didn't mention how easy it would be for a werewolf to tear the door off its hinges. I envisioned their massive, dark shape emerging from the door and ripping Jim's throat open. They could have made it down the hall and been long gone before anyone could get a good look at them too. Hey, Callan Chuck, get a look at this, 
Delaney said, tearing me out of my thoughts. I looked back to see him holding up a leathery jacket with a familiar skull patch on it. It was the same one I'd seen on the biker who'd been following James. Well, that is interesting, I said softly. I suppose that's Clara's then. I suppose it is, Delaney replied and gestured for me to follow him. He led me over to the kitchen table where two cups of spilled coffee sat on the table. Looks like she had a guest. Probably a stiff. Hmm, probably. I murmured, but I wasn't so sure. Assuming this was the same killer, which I wasn't fully convinced it was, they had to have been violent with James. They'd torn him to shreds, and with Jim, it had been quick, rushed perhaps. I thought about where his body was, out in the hall and slumped against the wall, like he'd been cowering. Shout casings, Delaney said, and crouched down by the table. Someone fired a gun in here. He looked up at one of the nearby officers. Hey, can we get a bag for this? That old couple did say they heard banging, I said. Could have been the gunshots. No gun, though. I found myself looking at the balcony again. Someone could have easily jumped from there, and they could have made it to the street in seconds. A smart werewolf wouldn't have followed them. To do that would have been running into the street and exposing themselves. No, they would have gone out of the door and either gone to the roof or changed back in the stairwell. And if they'd gone out the door and found a bystander, well, assuming Clara was the wolf she had already killed once and clearly she had already been trying to kill again, what use would a werewolf have for a gun after all? Claws are a much cleaner and more satisfying method of killing, and who would want to shoot Clara unless they knew what she was? unless they'd seen her transform and seen her kill. James had had someone on the motorcycle when he'd been killed, and that woman had probably seen everything. And of course, it would only make sense that Clara would try to tie up loose ends. I called Adrian again, and I left the crime scene. I never met any Clara Glick, he said. You think she's unregistered? It's a possibility, I replied. You sure you never saw a woman with a skull patch leather jacket in the bulldog before? I'm pretty sure. I can ask Alex if you like. Mm, do it. Let me know what he says. I saw Delaney coming out of the apartment and he gestured for me to come over. I'll call you back, Adrian. I said as I hung up before going over to join the man. What did you find? Got a hit on Clara's license plate, he said. And just now. He named the street, and as he did, I felt my blood run cold. He'd named the street Edna lived on. Delaney and I sped towards the apartment as fast as we could. My heart was racing in my chest as I wondered how the hell I'd missed this. Adrian was diligent. His community was tight-knit. They would have noticed an unfamiliar werewolf. It would have been damn near impossible for one to be living in Hamilton that Adrian didn't know about. As we parked in front of the building, I got out first. I spotted Clara's motorcycle parked nearby. She was already here. I'm going to need you to cover me, I said. On it, Delaney replied and started to follow me into the building. And I stopped him. No, stay out here. I don't want you getting hurt. You just said to cover you. I can handle myself, he replied indignantly. And I don't doubt that you can. But this isn't normal police business. Uh, just trust me, alright? He stared at me intensely. What are you talking about? I'll tell you what. When I walk out of this, I'll tell you everything over a drink. But I need you out here. If anything comes out of that building, and it isn't human, use this. I took my gun from my belt and offered it to him. I got my own, he said. Not like this one, you don't. If you see anything... Anything at all. If it's not human, your gun isn't going to do jack shit against it. But mine will. Just trust me, okay? I could tell that Delaney didn't understand. The why of all of this was far beyond him. I imagine that my insistence meant something to him, though, and he took the gun. Fine, but you owe me an explanation when this is finished. I promise I'll have one. I replied before I left him on the street. My heart was racing 
as I ran down the hall towards Eleanor's door. I didn't know what I would find and I didn't know what to expect. I could see her apartment door was open and I was just feet away when I heard the gunshots, three of them. No! I cried before bursting in the door. I was greeted by the sight of Clara Glick standing over Eleanor's body as the blood pooled around her head. The gun rested in her hand, trained at the body of the woman I'd loved, and Clara fixed me with a wild glare. Back off, she warned, rising the gun to aim at me now. Back the fuck off, right now. All right, let's just calm down, I said. I held my hands up to show her that I meant no harm. Calm down, Clara asked. She laughed humorously. Her eyes were frantic and wild. Calm the fuck down. No, fuck you. You, you didn't see what I fucking saw. That bitch. She's not fucking human. I remained still and stared into Clara's eyes. I saw a familiar, unfocused fear in them. You saw her transform, didn't you? I asked. You goddamn right I saw her fucking transform. I saw her drag my fucking man off his bike, rip him to goddamn pieces, and then this, this fucking bitch shows up at my place to kill me next. Fuck no. So you got to her first, I finished. Clara bit her lip before she gave a single stiff nod. Yeah, yeah, I fucking jumped her. She's fucking dead, right? Uh, these things can die, right? I looked at the gun in her hand, then back up at her. Well, it depends, I said. And did you use a silver bullet? A silver? Clara's eyes widened. As they did, there was a low growling behind her. I could see her trembling as she looked over to Elena and watched as her body began to shift and transform. No, 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 no! She stumbled back a few steps, taking aim and firing her final shots into Elena's body as the change came over her. Elena wouldn't die, though. Not when the beast was awoken. Run! I tried to say, but Clara didn't listen. She remained rooted to the spot in fear, a dark stain growing from the crotch of her jeans, and her gun aimed at Eleanor as she impotently pulled the trigger over and over again in the dumb hope that she could stop what was coming. Eleanor lunged, and I could only watch as Clara's skull was caught between her jaws. I could see the look of absolute terror on her face as Eleanor bit down. Her legs jerked frantically. Her final, terrified scream ended in a sickening crunch. The gun fell from her hand, and Clara died whimpering as Eleanor crushed her skull like a walnut. She viciously shook her head, decapitating Clara before sinking her claws into the woman's ribcage and ripping her in half with a wet, snapping noise. Eleanor howled in fury and looked at me next. My heart was racing. I stared down angry wolves before, and even if it was... Elena, this was no different. I held up a hand, trying to steady her. Eleanor, calm down, I tried to say. My voice was shaking, and she didn't give me any chance to say much more. One powerful arm dashed me against the wall, and I hit it so hard that I left a dent. I collapsed onto the ground, and my world went black. When I awoke, Eleanor was gone. I slowly picked myself up off the ground, groaning in pain as I did so. I could still smell her, along with the smell of Clara's corpse. My ears were ringing, but I was awake as I could get. I could hear other tenants in that apartment talking no doubt investigating all of the noise, but there were no screams and seemingly no other bodies. I needed to find Elena. I needed to find her before she hurt anybody else. I caught her scent. She was close, but where? I took a few steps forwards before my shoe hit something. I looked down to see a large plastic bottle of sleeping pills rolling away. Didn't think much of it and then ran out into the hall. I headed for the stairs, and she wouldn't have gone down, too much risk. The only place she could have gone was upwards towards the roof. It would have been easier to escape or to hide. So that was where I went. I burst into the stairwell and tore up the stairs, heading for the roof. I could smell Eleanor. She'd come this way. She was close. 
As I reached the doorway leading out onto the roof, I threw it open and stumbled out. I expected to see a hulking wolf waiting for me, and instead I just saw Eleanor. She changed back and her clothes were in tatters. She sat peacefully on the edge of the building. Her legs dangled over the oblivion and she looked back at me when she heard me approach. Hey Howard, she said softly, as if she hadn't just put me through a wall. Her voice was low, scared almost. Jesus Christ, what have you done, Eleanor? I asked. I suppose I fucked up, she replied. Well, what else is new, right? I imagine they'll put me down for this. You've killed three people. Yeah, I guess I did, she sighed. Are you going to sit with me? I've got to take you in, I replied. I'm sorry, Eleanor. She chuckled, and there was no humor in it. I'm not going to fight you, and you're not going to arrest me. I don't think that's really necessary right now. What are you talking about? I asked before I remembered the sleeping pills, and my heart sank. Eleanor, no! Uh, they put me down anyways, she said. The thought of that always scared me, you know? Dying like that in the cold, sterile environment. Just one needle and then you drift away. I think I prefer it like this. I approached her slowly before sitting down beside her. She leaned her head on my shoulder. Why did you do it? I asked. It was an accident, she said softly. James, he was sweet. He, I needed a fix. I could smell it on him. He offered to sell me some and I said yes. I fell off the wagon, she said. He said he had a friend outside the city. They were having a party and we could go and get fucked up. And I thought, what could possibly go wrong? I suppose he didn't mention Clara, I said. Well, she knew, if that's what you're asking, Eleanor said. James took me outside the city and we got high. And then she came with that gun of hers and she shot me. I woke up under a pile of dirt. No wallet, nothing. I got scared, I... I turned and I wasn't thinking clearly. I was so hurt, so angry, James. He just... He just tried to murder me. I caught his scent and I tracked him down and... <sighs> she sighed. I won't pretend I didn't enjoy it. He got what he deserved. And Clara? I asked. I thought she'd have my things, but instead, she just panicked, jumped out the window. I got scared and thought she would tell you, so I ran. I, well, you know what happened to the man in the hall, I assume. I came here and thought I could pack up and get out of town before anyone found me. But then Clara showed up and, oh God, I've really gotten myself into a mess, haven't I? You really did, I replied and held her close. And for a few moments, we were silent. Do you think I'll dream? Elena asked after a while. I don't know, I replied. She sounded sleepy. I could feel her body getting weaker. I hope I dream, she whispered. Maybe I'll dream about how things could have been. That'd be nice. Yeah. She buried her head into the crook of my neck, and I could feel her warm tears on my skin. I'm sorry, Howard. I know. I know. I let her sob quietly as she faded. I held her until her body went limp in my arms. Consciousness had left her first, and then her breathing slowed until finally it stopped. Eleanor slipped out of my arms, leaving nothing but another corpse behind. Like I promised, I told Delaney everything. He sat in his booth, drinking his beer in silence, barely able to believe what I told him. I wasn't all that surprised when he asked me to prove it. I had to take him out to the woods and show him. I don't regret that decision, though. And with the kind of life I live, it's nice to have people who understand, who know what you are. And besides, after what happened, I needed a friend. As imperfect as she was, I did love Eleanor. I paid for her burial. It was a quiet affair with just myself, Adrian and Delaney. She didn't really have anyone else, and sometimes I'll visit her grave. 
I won't pretend she was a good person. She was broken in ways I couldn't ever fix. But she was still the only woman I'd ever loved. And sometimes I think about how things could have been. And I wonder if maybe I was wrong to leave her. If I could have helped her get back on track. Maybe I could have. Maybe she was doomed long before I'd ever entered her life. At the end of the day, behind the beast, I'm only human. And so was Eleanor. Some say that lycanthropy is a curse. I'm not sure I agree with that, because some days I think I'd rather just be a beast than a man. Wow, 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 wow. Absolutely awesome, as it always is with this author, Head of Spectre. Thank you ever so much, brother, for allowing me to narrate this one on the show. Hope you enjoyed my rendition of your incredible work. Guys and girls, as ever, you know the drill. Please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help with the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear? If you haven't subscribed to DMT for us to fear, why not join us on the road to 50k and smash that subscribe button and throat punch the notification bell to stay up to date with all DMT content and community posts. And as ever guys, remember, be safe, not sorry.